Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm Diane Wallace. I'm director of the Winthrop Public Library and Museum. And joining me today is Winthrop Fire Chief Paul Flanagan and lifelong Winthrop resident Mr. Dick Banks. Dick is in the process of donating quite a large collection of firefighting materials to the library's museum. Um, there are things included in here concerning firefighters, apparatus, alarm systems, um, information about notable fires, and things that um, the library is going to make available to the general public for reference or research once we get it all um, accumulated and cataloged. Uh, we hope to have a permanent display of some of the materials in the future, and uh, we're pretty certain that this will be an integral part of the museum's collection at some point. Uh, we're also here today to specifically uh, talk about Fire, Pre Fire Prevention Week, which starts on October 9th. It's a great time of the year to remind people that we can all do our part to prevent fires by practicing good housekeeping um, at home as well as at work to minimize threats to life and property caused by such actions as improper disposal of cigarettes or um, flammable products. So um, Chief Lanigan and Mr. Bangs are going to discuss some of that um, right now. Thank you, Diane, and uh, to Mr. Bangs for me being invi invited here today. You know, I do have quite a past with the fire department, as does uh, Mr. Bangs. But again, as they mentioned, uh, kicking off Fire Prevention Week, uh, since Woodrow Wilson declared Fire Prevention Week back in 1922, it has been observed on the Sunday through Saturday period in which October 9th falls ever since. And the reason October 9th is the, uh, the date is one fire that we're all very familiar with was the Great Chicago Fire. And the historians haven't quite figured out if it was Mrs. O'Leary's cow or other reasons for the start of that fire. But that fire did killed 250 people and left 100,000 homeless. But that same week, there was another large fire in Wisconsin, the Fristigo Fire, which killed 1,152 people. So if you can imagine having two fires uh, within a day apart, uh, there was a great reason to come up with pre Fire Prevention Week. And since 1922, the fire service has come a long way with uh, the introduction of smoke detectors, fire alarm systems, non-combustible fabrics. We're all living much safer, but over the years and as you watch the evening news, there's still a large loss of life annually due to careless disposal of smoking materials and other human errors which result in fires in the home. In the month of October, we have teamed up with the American Red Cross to do a, a fire safety in the homes. So if you do not have smoke detectors or you know shut-ins or other people who haven't at this point installed smoke detectors, please feel free to call the chief's office at 617-539-1062 and get on our list. And firefighters will come out on a Saturday with American Red Cross and we will install both smoke detectors and carbon monoxide detectors in your house. And in, uh, all you'll have to do to qualify that for that is the representative from American Red Cross will be with us, and you'll have to listen to a quick 15-minute fire safety lecture on how to stay safe in your home. So again, if you do not have smoke detectors or CO detectors in your home or they're terribly outdated, please contact my office at 617-539-1062 to get on that list. We're hoping to build a list of a couple of hundred homes during October, and in the first two weeks in November, we will be coming out to install them. So that is our kickoff. We will be in all the elementary schools doing uh, child safety. We have the safety uh, program that we go in annually and speak to all the children which had its cut down considerably on home fires. That's great, Paul. That's great. That's good news for people. Pay attention, please, ladies and gentlemen. It's so important. The kids all learn in school to, to drop and roll on if their clothing ever becomes ignited and all. But come down to the park this week. You'll learn more. And again, if you don't have the smoke or carbon monoxide detectors, call the chief's office. He'll be able to uh, 
help you out in that department. But before we leave this, Paul spoke about how Mrs. O'Leary's cow started the whole thing, <laughs> we think. And, uh, and then the fire in Wisconsin. But ironically, one year later, almost to the day, the Great Boston Fire occurred. But we had a terrible fire in the city of Boston, starting in the Mercantile District, down around the lower end of Summer Street before you get down to Dewey Square, before South Station. And it swept through the city. And there was a problem at the time for the simple reason that there was a problem with the horses. The horses had a disease. Somehow it started up in Toronto, Canada, and migrated down to the States here. And <clears throat> they had this big fire occur in the city of Boston. And most of the time, the apparatus had to be hand pulled or was have towed somehow because the horses were all ill. They couldn't be used, which made it that much more difficult to get the apparatus and equipment there to fight the fire. Don't forget, in those eras, there were steamers, not the hand tubs like we know going back to the uh, continental days, but these were steam fire engines. And as you can imagine what a problem it was, there were 65 acres right here in the city of Boston destroyed all the way from around Liberty Square, which is where Summer Street, Kingston, and some of those other streets in the mercantile section merged, all the way up almost to the old State House on State Street. And you can imagine, one building after another, again, it was ironic, it happened just a year after Chicago, and the chief at the time in Boston had gone to Chicago to learn more, and everybody decided something had to be done here, improve water distribution system, the mains, and things of that nature. But again, housekeeping was very important because most buildings in those days were built all wooden interiors. They made them work outside. But anyway, as I say, there were a thousand people here in Boston left homeless, about 20,000 out of work because of these firms that went uh, destroyed by the fire. And uh, again, it was uh, a pretty serious event right here in Boston. As a matter of fact, there were, at the fire, I have the information on a little bit we'll talk about a little later on. 45 steamers are there, three hose carts, three ladder trucks called in, and the response came to Boston, not only the Boston Fire Department, but from Providence, Rhode Island, New Haven and Norwalk, Connecticut, Portsmouth and Manchester, New Hampshire, Biddeford, Maine, Charlestown Navy Yard, and the Watertown Arsenal. Many of these had to come in by railroad because that's the only way to get them here. So you can imagine what it was for a fire on that. So again, Fire Prevention Week, I thought it would be a good idea. Great time for Paul to tell you what's going on, but also to kick off this program because primarily we're here another, but go ahead, Diane, I'm, I'm infringing now. <laughs> no, thank you, that's wonderful. That, there's so many things going on today that I had no idea about, so I hope people are paying attention. And I knew about that fire in the briefest way and all those details, that's amazing. Oh. I think today people yeah. take the fire department for granted. We well, assume they'll just sweep in and take care of us, but there's a lot we can do to help ourselves it's before funny, it gets to that. Doing some research, not only for this program, but recently I talked to one of my friends, a retired uh, lieutenant from the Boston Fire Department, a real historian, and we got talking about some things, and he said, you know what? We're the experts now. There's no one else left to go back to find out the facts. When we were kids growing up, there were still some of those survivors from the 1800s around, okay? I had a friend, a deputy chief in Boston I used to visit, and uh, he was an engineer down <clears throat> on Congress Street when they had a steamer. And he said, what well, we had to do, well, all the time, he said, when they had steamers, they had to keep steam up on the boilers and the water warm. So they tapped right off of the building steamer, okay? There was a connection. We'd get an alarm. He said, you disconnect that, but they always had a fire built in the fire pot for the steamer. Now we'd go out, you have to light that with the kindling, get it going. We get to the scene, maybe a false alarm, back to the fire station, back the horses in, get the, and I clean out the fire pot and put another kindling. Well, you know, you do that a half a dozen times. In those days, they had one day off in 14. So you were there in the firehouse wow. 13 days in a row. And I said, my God, just think about the innovations, as you mentioned, from those days to today. But as Jim told me, this fellow I spoke to, he says, there's nobody left to talk to for the new crew. That's why we want to preserve so much of this data, because it's there for the reading. That's all it is. Now, Boston Globe did a great piece on this, a periodical. That'll be in the collection of the library. And also the story about the sick horses where they couldn't use them. Uh, another retired Boston chief 
I wrote that the episodic file, that will be also included in the stack of material you have for people, whether it be here local, and I sure, I'm sure that it'll be available through the Noble system. Yes. Yes. Well, you know, one good thing, too, as uh, <clears throat> the new firefighters go to some of the community colleges and other colleges, Salem State, to get their degree in fire science, one of the courses is the history of the fire service. Oh. So they do get indoctr indoctrinated how a lot of it started. And a lot of the fire codes that keep us safe today were all driven due to tragedies. Yep. Yep. You know, it wasn't a case, let's put sprinklers in, I think it would be a good idea. It's a result of the coconut grove, uh, sprinklers in the schools and everything were uh, a result of large lost fires in, in schools, public schools. Well, as Paul said, he mentioned those things, uh, on the, especially on the coconut grove, that's the, day, the revolving doors. Right. That's it, gone. Right. They collapse automatically at night. There's no right. more people trapped because of a revolving door. That was the only entrance or way out. Panic of hardware, which we take for granted as you're leaving a place of assembly, there's a crash bar. So years ago when there was a panic and everybody was pushing against the door, the doors used to open in. You couldn't get them open. Couldn't get them. Now as the crowd pushes, the doors go open and out everybody goes. Yep, yeah. So, so there's a lot of things have changed. Even today, I was talking to another classmate of mine that came in the office, my office this morning, and we got talking about things, and I said, what have we lived through? You, you know, me, I'm a pretty old guy right now, all right? But my father, if I'd said to him, there's going to be a man to the moon in my lifetime, what are you, crazy? You talk, what are you talking about? Our fathers couldn't conceive some of the things that have happened in the li our lifetime, my own lifetime, in the 30s, from there on out. You know, and so it's amazing how things, and the fire department have tried fire prevention and all the various activities to improve, but every once in a while you pick up the paper, a loss of life because of fire and some other unfortunate situation. Well, I remember laying in bed, I think it was, is it 10 years ago or 15, 10 years ago, I think, the uh, station nightclub fire. Yep. And they said in Ro yes. Rhode Island last night, 100 lives were lost which I really thought that the announcer had made a mistake because that was unheard of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But again, it was just due to, uh, you know, conditions that were unheard of in, in a place of assembly. Right, and illegal use of uh, pyrotechnics and all indoors and all, oh, boy. And combustible materials oh. on the wall for soundproofing. Yeah. But, you know, as a kid, uh, having my father in the fire service, we'd go out to dinner in a restaurant. Before we got our menus, we'd have to know where the exits and if <laughs> the place was sprinkled. So again, you, you should always look out for yourself. Know where you are. As a little kid, I used to race my turnabout in Quincy and uh, would be staying over people's houses in Quincy. And my father used to tell me, have a great time, but when you go to bed tonight, look out the window. Know where you are before you go to bed. And, um, you know, I used to go, oh, my God, Dad, I say the same thing to my son now. So, um, Again, you got to look out for each other, your family members, and you know have a plan how to get out of your own home. I'm sure that Paul will agree that uh, whenever I travel, my wife and I, and he travels with his wife, uh, we always check the hotel. Where's the? I mean, that's because we're familiar with the fire business, okay, from our long history and association through our families and our own interests. But you know, as you even travel, where are you staying in the hotel? Hotel? Where's the exits? Where's this? Where's that? And even now. Uh, a fire prevention officer here on Winthrop. First, a couple of years ago, we decided we were going to have B and B's, bed and breakfast. Well, the fire inspector at the time says, "I want those homes protected suitably." You're bringing people in. The hope is people visiting Boston and the area will come to Winthrop and take a, a advantage of the B and B's. But these are strangers. They don't know the house. We want to make sure it's properly lit. The railings are in place. The fire alarm system, all part of fire prevention. Mm -hmm. Like I said, the things that the common person takes for granted. So luckily, yep. people are on the job right. to protect us from ourselves, yep. right? Um, in a moment, Mr. Bangs is going to show us some of his um, collection, some of his photos. And I mentioned uh, before, the library is going to catalog these and have them available. Um, what I, um, my main goal is to have these digitized so that they can be available online, around the clock, to anybody. Um, who desires to look at them and learn about firefighting. And this way they don't have to um, handle materials which can be fragile at this point. Uh, they can um, get ruined. 
So um, having them digitized uh, is the best way to share them throughout the yeah. Noble Network. So um, you brought, well, the photos. Could, I'd like to get the books first, if we could, Diane, out of the way. Some of sure, that, all right? Sure. Because again, um, people said, "What are you donating all your books and your collection of fire material, fire matter things?" And I'm a founder of the Boston Fire Museum. Myself and another group taken over an, a former fire station in the South Boston area. And as a matter of fact, this very station where that gentleman I told you was on the steamer, he had to make the fires every time they came in and out of the station, you know, be ready to go. But anyway, and they said, why aren't you going to donate them to your own organization? I said, well, many of the people over there have the books, they have the periodicals, and, oh, well, what good are they going to do over there? So I said, I think I should donate these to the Winthrop Library. I had some encouragement from the trustees. And they said, okay, let's, so uh, what I've done is gather the books that I have, and Diane says she's going to catalog, catalog them all, categorize them and all. But I've got things about Winter Fire Department. I have a lot of books. Uh, my travels and my business occupation, as you know, I worked a number of years for Raytheon Company. And starting in the 60s, I traveled a lot throughout the country in the procurement. Uh, unfortunately, we were in a, I worked in a research and development type operation. And you can't send engineers off because sometimes when they're out talking to vendors or proposed vendors on a job, they make commitments. So there was always a purchasing guy along that made sure there's no commitment here, we're talking about things, or else you went out to reviews on jobs. Consequently, I went to a, did a lot of travel and oh, probably from oh, six, seven years, I was on the West Coast a week every month of the year, 12 months. My wife wasn't too happy with that because that week she was home alone and we had five, I mean, five kids in the family. But anyway, so I met a lot of people. And as a result of that, Paul Ditzel, who was a, quite a notable author, did a lot of books on fire departments. He had that kind of a, an interest in it. Eventually he became a fire commissioner in the city of Los Angeles. And when I go, first went out there, we got talking, well, it led to one thing or another. He had done a couple of books will be in the library. And then he wanted to do a book on fireboats and fire alarm systems, things like that. And I went to work with my friends here in Boston. Uh, and of course, he did research throughout the country. So the books are going to be in the library from Paul Ditzel. They were all hardcover. They'll be cataloged so you can look through them. And there may be a project someday that some kid wants to look some of mm -hmm. these things up. It's there. Along with that, there'll be the things on the Great Boston Fire and a number of other things from New York, a history of the Boston Fire Department, things of that nature. And uh, again, so it'll all be there. I'm sure, Diane, some of these things, especially the photographs, will probably wind up in the museum section yes, yes. because you can't issue those out and no, have any success no. with them. We want to take care of those. But let's get some history. Paul, why don't you tell a little bit about your fire department, your family fire department association, your grandfather and your dad and yourself. Okay, thank you, Dick. Um, my family, my father, uh, my grandfather, Charles Aloysius Flanagan, jo uh, joined the Winter Fire Department in 1903. Um, again, in, uh, what happened there is he, he worked uh, for several months on the Winter Fire Department, and again, a lot of the, uh, the seniors that we've talked to over the years used to say in Winter, uh, Irish Catholics not, need not apply in Winter. That was just the, the era that we lived in as we lived through many eras in, the, in our country. So shortly after being appointed to the fire department, they, uh, they terminated him. But because my grandfather was so good with the horses, they brought him back a few months later, and he finished out a 44-year career with the Winter Fire Department, and he, he retired as a lieutenant. My father, Charles Joseph Flanagan, um, he got the privilege to work with his grandfather, his father, my grandfather, for six months. And um, my father went on the fire department in 1943 provisionally, and he was appointed permanent in 1947. I had the privilege of working with my father for 10 years. I got appointed uh, in August of 1978. So there's been somebody continuously in the, the two buildings that the fire department occupies now at 40 Pauline Street and 416 Shirley Street. Uh, continuous from 1903 till today. Um, so basically, if, if you do the math, that's 113 continuous years. And my brother, Charles Joseph Flanagan II, or junior, if you will, 
he has 30 years concurrently. So uh, we're, we're put roughly 155 years or so on the department. <laughs> and uh, we've had, it, as you can say, we've had a great run of it. But, you know, Dick, as you look back, and even in your day, there was numerous, there was the Hazlitt, Hazlitt family combined put in, you know, in the high 80s, the Riley brothers, uh, the Benson brothers, we got the Rich brothers. There was a lot of families that had multiple members. And it doesn't matter if you go to Winthrop, Boston, the tradition, and I go to chiefs meetings, uh, I will be talking with chiefs and they'll say, well, my father was a chief or, you know, my brother's a deputy chief in Boston. So somewhat like the police department, but I think it's greater tradition in the fire service that families were involved for years and years and years in the fire service. Because I knew when I was in Winthrop High School, two things I wanted to be, I wanted to be a firefighter and I wanted to be an electrician. And I got my electrician's license uh, three months before I got appointed to the fire department <laughs> at uh, 22 years old. So I guess, you know, my wishes all came true. And, you know, I consider myself a big fish in a little bowl here in Winthrop, but it's been great. And, uh, you know, sitting to be able to talk to you that also had great interest. You know, years ago, the, the fire department, as you were talking prior to the show with Diane, they didn't make a lot of money. The only guys that were in the fire department are the guys that wanted to be on the fire department. Right. And, uh, you know, I hung at the firehouse. I only lived one house up from uh, the Shirley Street Station. I hung there from the time I was five. <laughs> and I grew up there. And some of the World War II guys that, you know, would be picking on me and uh, sending me down to the old Delby's to pick up uh, their lunch or whatever, you know, as they were finishing out their careers, I, you know, and I think you were the gentleman that promoted me to a lieutenant when you're on the board of fire engineers, I became their boss. So I was a little kid that was getting under their skin when they first got appointed, and I was actually their lieutenant as they were finishing up their careers. So, you know, my story is just amazing to be part of that whole culture when it was at its best, I feel. But keep in it's mind also what uh, Paul was just saying, there were those, we have a terminology of people have followed the fire department. They call them, some people call them fire buffs, sparks, one thing or another. And he's always been a spark. And his brother uh, Chuck that's on the, he's a captain as he said today, but I want to go back to your dad, I mean your grandfather for a minute about your grandfather being appointed. And I happen to hear these stories from my father who was on the fire department. Before I get into my own, somebody talked a little bit about Charles Aloysius. Evidently, very well thought of here in town. Could handle horses and all. Would you like to come to work for the fire department? Yes, I would. Well, it seems Charles Aloysius had a whole week working, and I don't know how many hours. Again, they were long, long hours. <coughs> Basically, a call fire department at that time, a volunteer, where they had somebody to drive the Hassan team, whether it was the hose wagon or the steamer eventually will show you, or the ladder truck, whatever. But anyway, come Saturday, and Charles Aloysius went to the powers to be, and he said, I need a couple of hours off tomorrow to go to Mass. Where? Now, you know, the pilgrims left the old sod in order to come over here for religious uh, opportunities and to get away from some of the problems they had back in merry old England. They all weren't nice guys, which is why, why Roger Williams, as a matter of fact, went to Providence or went to Rhode Island and founded Providence because there was some intolerance even then as opposed to or, you know, things we find out going on but way back. But anyway, Charles Aloysius was terminated and they found after a week, no, he's too damn good. We're going to keep, he went back to work and got his time off to go to church on Sundays, which is a kind of an interesting that's side like yep. Heck of a thing, but my dad. Okay, as far as that's Paul, and I do, did say that I um, have been involved many, many years uh, on the fire department. My father, though, my great, my grandfather, Harry Bangs, the founder of the moving business, he was a member of the volunteer fire department here in the early 1800s. In those days, Paul, they appointed from within people to the Board of Engineers. They just went selectman appointees, okay? So we served on that. So I knew that. He was a call man here in Winthrop. My own father went on in 1939 as a permanent member, although after World War II when he came back from the service, he was a, a call man. That was long before civil service. A lot of things were different in those days, okay? We're going to show you some photographs, as Diane says on these things. But that's how the background of Paul and I and our family, we go way back on these things. And I heard stories from my dad and even from his dad uh, about things that happened 
I well, that I couldn't necessarily recall, but his own father, Paul's grandfather, told about that. So again, the long work weeks and things of that nature. And uh, so, as a result of that, again, i fortunate. I was appointed to the Board of Fire Engineers. Here's an interesting one. I, Diane said to me, what's this Board of Fire Engineers? Well, <laughs> years ago, that's the way they set things up. As a matter of fact, the chief in Boston was known as the chief engineer. And evidently, when they got steamers, uh, he was supposed to know the most of them. Um, and they had foremen. And now there were captains for every fire company. But those, that was old terminology. But I was appointed to the Board of Fire Engineers. And whose name came up for a promote, a, appointment to the fire department? This fellow over here. It was my pleasure to, to prom, appoint him to the fire department with my colleagues. And lo and behold, a few years later, I served as a selectman. And who came up for promotion? The fire captain. So he and I, we have a, a little rapport among ourselves. So anyway, let's get into some of the photographs here that I have. Now I got a couple of photos of that. That's the Winthrop's engine one, and I don't know who was driving, couldn't identify. There's nobody left to ask these questions of, ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately. So that's Winthrop's steamer, and I think that was down at the beach stations, quartered down there at the time. And you probably wondered, you see firehouse doors are all square now, overhead doors, but there was always a round door. They had to have a round door for the top of the steamer to clear, which, you know, those are things that they did in those days, how you designed. But here's a picture, of Paul, maybe you'll recognize something, and this has to be in the background, the uh, the Shirley Street School before they tore it down. The now, wooden Shirley Street School, correct? Uh, huh? The w Shirley Street School. I'm just saying, but they, yep. they say, now, I don't know who the two uh, men are. One is pulling the box. That, tel uh, that firebox was at the corner by uh, Sturgis Street across the street <coughs> yep. from Sturgis Street, and I don't know who the two old timers are there, but uh, that's what Shirley Street looked like in those days, ladies and gentlemen, when they were horses pulling. Uh, and then this picture here, they're actually pulling a sled. The what? The, the ladders are on a sled yeah, yeah. for the winter. Yeah. And th there's another picture of the steamer. Uh, exploding smoke out of the stack there, headed over where Lewis Lake is, no doubt. That's where they were showing these things. Yep. How many horses would they have had? What that? How many horses would have been in the fire department? Generally three. Just three? Yeah. Well, on, on steamers pulling them because they were heavy. Mm -hmm. And ladder trucks, you might get away with two. Okay. Per unit. Per, oh, yeah, per oh, yeah. Unit. oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, we finally got motorized. Now, this had to be, had to happen right after World War I, I guess, ladies and gentlemen. And this, uh, all I know is they called it the Kelly because it was made by a company named Kelly. And I assume those folks on the on the uh, top of this, my grandfather, by the way, is to the far right, they must have been the Board of Fire Engineers. And who the gentlemen are uh, in front of it, I don't know. But uh, this was, uh, I guess, when we first became uh, motorized, and this was hose to it in front of the existing center station. Paul may want to look that over. Yeah, and again, mm -hmm. as you look at the station, uh, it doesn't look much different than it did back then. And uh, that station was built, and the firefighters uh, were occupying that in 1887. Wow. Yeah. Now, this is the same thing I just showed you with the hard rubber tires just showed you. Now we have pneumatic tires. Same piece, a little older, but they came up with pneumatic tires. And, uh, boy, we really, uh, and that, there's another picture of it coming up, I think, next, which again shows the pneumatic tires. Look at that. How about that? Wow. Now, that's the old <laughs> beach station with the doors with the rounded top. But again, before they took out those two doors, because years, years ago, the ladder was on one side, the engine on the other. But once they bought that area ladder truck, our first area ladder truck, which was delivered in 1942, no power steering, they had to take the two doors out, put one 22-foot wide door in there so they could make the turn in and out of the station and the side streets. Now we're getting a little further along. We have another. Now we have a chemical company. And I do know some of the fellows on that. Driving was a fellow by the name of Mike Belcher. And on the back step, there was Howard Perkins, Leon Woods, and Charlie Lawrence. And I believe it's probably uh, Chief Belcher, Mike's father, uh, was in the right-hand seat on that. But uh, we're getting better, ladies and gentlemen. We're getting a little more modern as we go along. And I'm still not yet born, so <laughs> I'll, I'll weigh in later. No, no, he wasn't even born. Yeah. Now, this was another, a, a newer one, 
And if you could see behind that, we had an Aaron Sparks pumper at the beach. So this had to be in the 20s. But you see the engine was parked on one side, the ladder would be on the other side. No overhead doors in those days. But this was just modernizing some of the winter fire department. Well, again, Mike Belcher in chemical two seat, okay? And when you say ladder, they're just wooden ladders. Oh, yeah. Oh, for years, yeah, it's wow. only been Let's ladder. talk about ladders for a minute. His father was so reluctant to change to aluminum ladders. He did eventually because he yep. couldn't get wooden ladders, but he always felt a wooden ladder against the shingled homes like we have here was better. They wouldn't slide on you. Uh -huh. Well, yep. they improved. Sure, sure. But they were, you know, the one big thing that helped aluminum ladders come in was the difference in the weight. Right. We yep. had a 50 foot wood ladder that was almost 500 pounds yep. to raise. Wow. Yeah, it took two men to pull. It took 10 men on the boy to roll. Here's a, here's a ladder truck oh, that, uh, right. I don't know if your dad drove that. I mean, your grandfather drove that or not, Paul, but that had to be back in the uh, 30s, I suppose. Yeah, and that's yeah. right by what was the Winthrop Theater uh, in the building now that Action Ambulance is running out of, yeah. right across from the beach station. Right. These things probably didn't have that much speed, did they? No, but again, no. we're only 1.6 square miles. Yeah, that's true, yeah. that's true. This is a little more modern. This is a ladder truck that went to the center. And on the <coughs> particular one, the gentleman on the right-hand seat with the white hair was Captain Coggins. And on the running board, the first fellow was, again, Mike, um, I'm not sure of that, the second man down with the mustache, that was Henry Keel. Henry Keel had the Keel uh, plumbing business here and went to next to fire station. The next one is Mike Belcher who again was Chief Belcher's son, who was standing up on the uh, fender, and I think Cy Rock was the officer next to the Chief standing up. A little more modern ladder truck, they made by the Robertson Company in Cambridge, but uh, it had to be in the 30s, I imagine. Now, this is 1949, and this we had the two engine companies here, but now there's the beach station with the one door, so it made it easier for our area ladder truck to get in and out. And this was a replace a uh, one of those chemical companies we talked. Now we're going back again a little ways. I'm going to show you. This is our 1918 Aaron Fox thousand gallon per minute pumper, and this one was at the station. It was the first major piece of fire apparatus motorized with a pump on it and everything else. We had hose carts until then. And in this picture is John Morris and Leon Woods, and they're up, it looks to me as though this was taken on Revere Street up by Fort Banks at a fire. And they were connected to a hydrant and uh, pumping water. When did hydrants come into being? Well, yeah, let me see, I've got some statistics here. <laughs> okay, some statistics on Winthrop. Okay, Winthrop was first incorporated to the town in 1852, and they had to hold a time meeting, which they did, and at that, that town meeting, the first town meeting, they elected a board of selectmen, and then they had to establish departments, like the town clerk, the school department, the fire and the police departments, the health department, whatever was required by law. Now, there were certain water mains in town, there was a company known as the Revere Water Co Company, and they had run a few lines, but most places until that town were depending on wells in their backyard, artesian wells, okay? However, the town acquired the Revere Water Company in 1884, and now we started the big system of putting in hydrants, water mains, domestic service to the house and things like that. The town was electrified in 1887, so we got electricity and we get modern, see? 1889, we even had a sewer system. and. 1901, the gas lines were installed for domestic use for cooking, lighting. Lights. In those days, you had gas lights on the house. Now, the original hose house for the fire department was across the street from the current central fire station. There used to be a pit, but there was a building across the street, and that was there. And again, Beach Station was built in 1904, I think you said, Paul. Or Completed 1903. 1904, okay. yep. And again, we had the, obviously, uh, there were a lot of volunteers. Uh, then we got our steamers in, the, and uh, a few permanent men, and things went on from there. And this is a 1924 Aaron Fox, which was the first one worked out so successfully, and the fellow by the name of Bill Ricker was on the fire department. He was shown in the seat of that, and that was at the beach station with the ladder truck, and the center had their 1918 pumper we showed you, 
And uh, so we had a pumping engine on each creation now. And of course, the department cool. basically only had chauffeurs. We might have had a dozen total people, ladies and gentlemen, including up to 1939, when my own father was, was appointed, uh, because we depended on call men. And we had so many, and I'm going to show you a picture of some of the call men in a few minutes, but we depended on call men. They used to get 50 cents an hour for showing up to fi go to fires, whether it was a big fire or a little fire. It didn't matter. One hour, five hour, it was 50 cents an hour, and that's how we were in the department. This is a photograph taken back in the 50s, and uh, uh, well, Paul's father is there. He can point them out to you and some yeah, of the men. That yeah, as things. you look at the picture from uh, going from left to right, the second gentleman in is my grandfather, and next oh. to him is my father, and my father, I think in that picture, is uh, rank of a captain at that time. But you know, uh, every year there was Fireman's Memorial Sunday, which you find that you see that in the paper, Boston, a lot of departments celebrate that. And every year, and this was one of those events on a Sunday morning, and they all picked a spot. And again, we had a lot of these to call them in. On the far left is a fellow named John Kennedy. Always was invited. He was in charge of our sewer system in town. And as, you, as Paul pointed out, his grandfather and his father were there. And uh, a, lot, a lot of men, uh, no sense me naming them off, because there won't be too many around the town in Winthrop uh, who would remember these names at this point in time. And we had another one, 1952, we celebrated the 100th anniversary of Winthrop Incorporated the town. Well, to start with, they came up with a horse-drawn chief's buggy, they called it. It was a one-horse-drawn thing, and who were in the buggy, but at the time, Bill Floyd was chief, chief engineer at the time, and uh, Charles Aloysius Flanagan, Paul's granddad was the driver on that. He led the parade off. And a fellow by the name of Laurie Clark, a retired a Newton firefighter, he, again, Sparky and all, he bought an old steamer. And he volunteered. He says, I'll put the steamer in the parade, but you're going to have to get the horses and some. My father says, I drove horses. Sure, he drove horses. That's back in the 1900 when he was a, uh, first got out of school because he only went to the eighth grade in those days you went to work. Well, they brought three horses. Somebody, Phil Floyd, got them somewhere, and my father said, I'll take care of driving the horses. These tr horses had a mind of their own. They didn't <laughs> give a damn about my father. We're going wherever the parade goes. But anyway, he had the biggest kick out of driving that at the time, and he, uh, this is right in front of the Elk coming up Washington Avenue, and everybody thought that was great to have a steamer like that in the parade. This is this gentleman. I'm going to hold on and identify. This is a, a plaque that we had made up, a, a, a photograph mounted on a, on a plaque demonstration. It's going in the library collection, and it's entitled Winter Fire Department Engine 2, 1918 Aaron's Fox 1,000 gallon capa capacity pumping engine, participates in the Boston Mass Parade commemorating the 50th anniversary of the Great Boston Fire on November 9th. 1872. Now, looking at this photo, some of these names may or may not ring a bell. Bottom row, follow me with Joe Poor, Arthur Maskell, uh, let me see, where are we? Oh, yeah, Fred Cochran, Arthur Mention, who I had mentioned, my own father, the string bead, okay? Fred uh, Everbeck, they were uh, not senior, he was at the beach station on the department, permanent. His son followed him on the fire department. Elmer Woods, George Buck Floyd, again, he was in charge of the beach station. I think Cy Rock was the last one, and the fellow on the far right in the uniform, Tim McCarty. Who the gentleman is behind, I don't know. But I'll tell you something about Tim McCarty. He was on the fire department. Those are the good old days, all right? He married a woman uh, who of means, evidently, and she didn't like the cold winter. So every year, Tim would say, we're going to Florida. Well, he didn't fly down like we fly down today. But anyway, so the pop, go ahead, go to Florida for a couple of months. They had to hire somebody, one of the call men, to fill in for Tim while he and the wife went to Florida for January and February. How about that? Just take times off like that. You can't do that <laughs> anymore. Second row, Leon Woods and Charlie Burrow, member of the water department. The top row, Chief Warren Belcher. The next one, one of our former team uh, tree wardens, Millard Smith. I follow, I don't know the next two. And the last one, Warren Wickwire, another WW1 vet, 
who became a permanent member of this department. So anyway, this will be on display in the library or in the museum for everybody to see, and that was the big deal. They, that puppet was delivered that year and just in time so that almost the whole department went into the parade that day. Your father, a grandfather wasn't there, Paul. He was one of those that must be left behind to mind the store while all these birds are out of town Getting parading. Right. So that's right. some of the history. Okay. And I started to make mention about, Diane had asked me, with this fire engineers? Well, you know, we came up, again, the chief engineer uh, was, uh, well, because he was supposed to be the smartest guy and all. And then we had a board of fire engineers from, many, since 18, from 1852 to 1980. And then the town meeting finally voted to have a permanent fire chief because in the latter years, those boards were, all engineers were appointed uh, by the selectmen. And uh, there were some good boards and bad boards and those for, let's get rid of the political business. So they had decided to appoint a permanent fire chief, change the things around. Uh, the board of selectmen is long gone. So now we have a photograph Diane brought in from the library because he was also active there of our first fire, first permanent fire chief. Ed Hazlett was appointed fire chief in 1980, and he headed the department up for a number of years. And when Ed retired, which he had it at 65, Paul's dad, Charles, succeeded him in this. So Diane brought that photograph from the library in today just to show another picture of Ed. Yes, the oh. um, community room in the library is named for Chief Hazlitt, and um, the library's proud to uh, be associated with uh, the fire department on numerous occasions, I guess. You know, a lot of uh, local firefighters have supported the library over the years, and we're thrilled to add these items to our collection that mm -hmm. will highlight all the work of the firefighters on behalf of Winthrop. So um, if you come by to a program at our um, community room, you can see the photo and the plaque. He died in uh, 2002 at age 83, and I believe this has been hanging there since then. And one last shot as far as chief engineers. As I said, I traveled a lot. The term is gone from Winthrop. No longer there's a permanent fire chief. Paul holds that position today. Done a great job on it. But in my travels, I found out talking to my friend, the author in Los Angeles, out there uh, at one point in time, again, he was on the fire commission, and the official title of the city of Los Angeles. Now, that's a big city. The chief engineer of the fire chief in Los Angeles is f of the fire chief. F chief engineer and general manager, Los Angeles Fire Department. So how things evolve, ladies and gentlemen, you know, crazy. Well, even to this day, uh, one of the best fire departments in the area, Cambridge, being a class one fire department, it's very hard to become a class one fire department. But Jerry Redden, who is the chief, is referred to as the chief. Chief engineer, engineer still. To okay, this day. so that Correct. term is hung over. Yeah. Yep. And uh, so, so these again, these are some of the books. As I say, I just brought in. We put them on top of the table. Diane says she's going to catalog them all. She's going to put them on the shelves in there. And if you have any of the kids, anybody, just they're enjoyable reading for some folks that like to get into historical data. And uh, well, uh, it's going to be all there. This way it's going to be put to use for the future. I just don't want it to die out and not have people have access to some of this data. Well, some people say, you're crazy, but <laughs> I, I'm trying to do my part no, on behalf no, of the nice town. It's nice that you think of it beforehand, you know. Well. Some of your family might just toss them out, you know, not realizing the value. And there may not be duplicates yeah. around. So well, that's there He's putting uh, the names, all the names that he recognizes, you know, the people he recognizes. He's putting the names right yeah, on there. Yeah. So yeah, I'm getting all the information we can to um, well, Diane, add. I don't know if you got a call, but just this week, uh, two uh, ladies rang the bell at the Santa Firehouse, and they're Leon Woods' relatives. And I think they were calling. They called the library looking to see when this show is going to be. But they're out now. They're, they're retired, and they're tracking down you know, a little history oh. on, on Leon see? Woods. Well, that's true. So they will be referring to that. So earlier in the, the day, we had done a smoke detector inspection at 32 Marshall Street. So when I said to the ladies, because I happen to answer the phone, anyone else, I mean, I answered the door. Anyone else, they asked about Leon Woods, they wouldn't have a clue, you know. Yeah, uh, but you. Forget it. I mean, you come to the door, they don't know who you are. So well, they're not new people now. Because I have new people there. But 
I said, what are you up to now that you're leaving the firehouse? He said, well, we got to go by where Leon lived. And it was 32 Marshall Street, wow. a house we had done a smoke detector inspection wow. this morning. But, um, crazy things, that huh? That is crazy. Yep. Crazy things. Right. But, you know, back in those days, the Winter Fire Department was doing, you know, a couple hundred runs a day. And, I, uh, you I, know, I last mean. year we did 3,200 runs and, and we're way ahead of that pace. Mainly due to the folks that are living independently in their 90s yeah. at home. You know, so our business has changed due to great fire prevention uh, innovations. They've kind of put us out of the fire business, but we've walked into, you know, Homeland Security, uh, you know, Hazmat. But, but EMS is a big EMS part of your business. EMS is huge now. But this has been great. You know what? I forgot to mention that the chief was a library trustee. That's oh, yeah. correct. I think yeah. I forgot to say that. And that's, that's why they named the room after him. Yeah, so I think that he oh, must yeah. have been highly thought of. Yep. And um, oh. like a lot of people in this town, he wore many hats. Yep. But he was very fond oh, yeah. of the library, so it's nice to see that all tied together. Yep, yep. there you go. You know, but so this is a program you. highlighting Hunter. fire prevention. We thought it would be a great time to have the program, not just a donation, but let's get word out. You can never be too careful around fire. You know, things happen, it's unfortunate, and you see crazy accidents, but boy, if you can minimize those opportunities because it's crazy to lose a life because of something foolish. Yes. Okay. And stay tuned to the library's website and Facebook, and we'll let you know when we've got things on display. Well, thank and we'll you. have a little ceremony. Thank you, Diane, okay. for coming over today and spending the time with us. And uh, we appreciate it. I appreciate it. It highlights my things, but it also gives Paul and I a chance to talk about old winter, bringing it up to date, modern winter. And, uh, well, it's our, it's our pleasure. We enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you.